All right. Okay. Welcome everybody to the first session, R2I online conference. Um, again, thank you very much for coming. This conference is, uh, is substituting both uh, the RQI North yearly conference and, uh, and the Australian conference uh, that we call RQI South, but it's actually the International Workshop on Relativistic Quantum Information that Tim Ralph runs. So as uh, you know from the emails, we're going to have two sessions. One, let's call it the Waterloo session, that is this one. And then we're going to have the Australian session that's going to run for the first month uh, in the, well, in what would be our evenings, but uh, everybody else suggests by <laughs> my time zone. We're very happy that you're here. This is a conference that um, is uh, very challenging to run in the sense of we have no admin support and all the support, uh, all the hard work that is being done in this conference is done, done by uh, Rick here. Rick, can you say hello? Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for acknowledging that, Edward. It's been a lot of work, but it's been a pleasure for sure. That's, uh, that's Rick. I may call him Thales from time to time. As you can ignore it, he's got a duality of names. He's a, he's a PhD student of mine and he's pretty amazing. So anyway, we have all to thank uh, Rick for all the, all the help and all the work that he's put into this. Now, all right, so I think that because this conference is not uh, so much, uh, and there's a not, not a lot of ceremony with it, we can go down to the science. You know the list of speakers and the first speaker of the conference uh, is gonna be Professor Don Page. Uh, professor at the University of Alberta, and uh, I think uh, Don, you need very little in the in the way of presentation. I think everybody knows you. <laughs> you can uh, go ahead and share your screen, and uh, it's our pleasure to have you here. I think uh, we're gonna just I'm gonna just let you talk, and if anybody has any problem with recording the talks, please now or uh, stay silent for the rest of the conference. Ah, I'm gonna ask everybody as well to mute themselves, except for, of course, uh, the speaker. And uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, you unmute yourself. Uh, you actually, if it's during the conference, raise your hand and uh, we will ask the speaker if the speaker wants to take the question. And if not, just wait for the end of the session. There will be plenty of discussion time. All right, Don, uh, you can start whenever you want. The floor is yours. Okay, well, thank, thank you. Yeah, it's great. It's great to be sort of Zooming to the at the perimeter institute even though with covid we're all locked out of the perimeter but anyway it's been good to, good to be here i'll start with my picture maybe some of you seen before from the top of mount temple in in banff national park near with lake moraine moraine lake down below and my title is does decoherence make observations classical so <clears throat> the the fact that we rarely directly observe much quantum uncertainty is often attributed to decoherence. However, decoherence does not reduce the quantum uncertainty in the full quantum state. Whether or not it reduces the quantum uncertainties in observations depends on the un yet unknown rules for getting observations and, and their measures or quote probabilities from the quantum state. So some schematic possibilities for what these rules might be in a simple toy model are discussed. So, well, as a, a quick review, that's probably unnecessary for this audience, but anyway, decoherence is the development of quantum correlations between a quantum subsystem and its environment. And since the entire universe or multiverse, if the full quantum state is that of a collection of sometime interacting subuniverses, is since the universe or multiverse is believed to be the smallest completely isolated system it contains, any subsystem smaller than the whole universe or multiverse, though I, I'll use the use word universe. And when I use universe, I'll include the whole thing, that the, the whole quantum state, which might be considered a multiverse if it has many different parts with different coupling constants, et cetera. But anyway, I'll, I'll just call it a universe here. So any subsystem smaller than the whole universe has at least at some time interaction with other parts of, in its environment and hence can develop quantum correlations with its environment. So when any subsystem has quantum correlations with its environment, it cannot be in a pure state, but must be in a mixed state. That is, it cannot be correctly described by a wave function, but instead only by a density matrix. And here, I'll, for simply, I'll leave aside 
uh, possibilities such as a C star algebra state when the state space is too big to be described by a Hilbert space. But I'll, here I'll just assume it's a Hilbert space and you can have a density matrix for the, <laughs> to describe the mixed state. Well, in particular for, for a state for a system that has correlations with others, there's no complete set of observables for which the subsystem has precise values, as would be the case if the subsystem were in a pure state given by a wave function with no quantum correlations <laughs> with its environment. So, you know, if it was in a pure state, there's some observable. Of course, there's, you, you, you know, conjugate observables don't both have, have uh, <clears throat> precise values, but, but you know, if you have a if you have a qubit, for example, then if it's in a pure state, then the spin in some direction is definite. It's definitely up, and, and there's some direction which the spin is directly up, um, and so you have you have uh, unit. It, it's it's it, it that has a definite value. But if it's a mixed state, then then there's no direction in which the spin is is definitely up. Or to put it another way, the density operator corresponding to the density matrix of the correlated subsystem. It's not a rank one projector operator, and hence it's not an eigenstate with a unit eigenvalue for any rank one projection operator. Hmm. Are there questions or what's, I hear something, anyway. Somebody came in with a microphone open. Oh, okay, I, okay, it's not a question, I'll, I'll just- I just muted it, sorry. Perfect, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, now, we can have a measure of how mixed it is, and the von Neumann entropy is one measure of that. So the density operator of a mixed state can be written as a sum of orthogonal rank one projection operators as boldface P, P sub I, uh, with different different I being corresponding to different rank one <laughs> operators. So those are like the the uh, the cat in the bra of a, of a wave function or of a quantum, or of a, yeah. Quantum state in that form, and then with non-negative coefficients, little p so by summing to unity, that could be considered almost as if they were the probabilities for the full density operator to be one of the projection <coughs> operators. So here we could write the density matrix as a sum with these non-negative coefficients times the rank one projection operators. And maybe as a side, and I'd say that it's the whole thing that's real, and it's not. I would. I'm taking essentially a many worlds view that there's no collapse of the wave function or of the quantum state, so that these P's are not propensities for potentialities to become actualities. They're, they're really just part of the description of the full state. Anyway, then the von Neumann entropy, the subsystem with mixed state density operator rho is S, it's the trace of rho times log rho. And in terms of these, these coefficients P, they're the minus the sum of the P's times the log P. And that's positive if the if the subsystem quantum state's not pure, and that's necessarily the case if the subsystem has quantum correlations with its environment. And as an aside, one formulation of the second law of thermodynamics is that with a suitable division, and that there sort of raises the question, a suitable division, maybe quasi-local division of the universe in the subsystems, the quantum state of the universe is such that the sum of the von Neumann entropies of the subsystem increases with time. If, if it's unitary evolution, the, 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 the von Neumann entropy of the whole thing stays the same. But if you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you take the von Neumann entropies of the subsystems, then those can be bigger than unity. And typically, the sum of those tends to increase. Okay, so one, now we talk about this decoherence that uh, H. Dieter Zay's seminal paper on decoherence was this paper at the top of 1970. And it emphasized that the customary previous description of a measurement apparatus M and a measured subsystem S as jointly being in a pure state of M plus S is invalid as both of these parts also interact with their environment E, which we'll take here to be the rest of the universe. So though M plus S plus E make up a closed system, i.e. the whole universe, that here I'll assume will be to evolve unitar unitarily, you know, leaving aside possibilities such as information loss and black hole formation and evaporation, for which there seem to be ever growing doubts among theorists working on that problem. It seems like it's growing, growing consensus that, that the information isn't lost, that the whole system evolves unitarily, which I'll assume here. 
then this, this M plus S subsystem, which doesn't include E, it does not evolve unitarily because it's interacting with, with E. So the combined subsystem is not a closed system, does not evolve unitarily to state in a combined pure state, even if it had started in a pure state. In other words, M plus S becomes a mixed state. Now I want to focus on an example from the paper that Zay wrote with use. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Jose, Jose I guess. Um, the emergence of classical properties through interaction with the environment um, in 1985. And it discusses many things, but I'm going to focus on the part where they discuss uh, an object of mass M with density matrix just moving in one dimension. So the density matrix uh, depends on X and X prime. And then we also write T as an argument because it, the, 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 it changes with T. And so this is moving in one dimension in the environment of many small scatters, but otherwise freely. Um, and then they show to some approximation obeys this equation of, of motion down below the, the, uh, the first term. Let's see, I guess I can get my pointer to go there. So this, the, these first things are what would have if it's not, not interacting at all with the environment. And then, and then with the coupling to the environment, basically the, you have an exponential decay in the off diagonal pieces of the, of the density matrix. And then they calculate this coefficient was this where in is the number density of scattering particles, sigma is the affected cross section of the scatterings, V is the relative mean relative velocity of the scattering particles and K P over H bar is the weight RMS wave number of the scattering particles with RMS momentum P. So you get this equation. It, it does, it does ignore sort of the, the if, if the scattering particle is moving at a different velocity from the, sorry, if, if the main particle, the, the particle of mass M is moving at a different velocity from the mean velocity of the scatters, there would be drag, but that's not really included here. It, it, it only, it's sort of a, it, it's ignoring the difference in the mean velocity of the, well, in the, the velocity of the particle uh, from the mean velocity of the scatterers, but it's, it's taking into account some of the scattering. So now if you just to some, to uh, rewrite a little bit simpler, if y is how off diagonal the element is, it's the, the one argument of the density matrix minus the other one, and z is the sum of the two, then a convenient model to use to analyze is a Gaussian ansatz that the density matrix goes exponentially decreasing in both y and z, and then also uh, has a a uh, imaginary piece that gives oscillations of the density matrix for y times z. And then this is just the, no the normalization factor d. So then in terms of that, the evolution equation becomes, becomes this. And then if you plug that in, in to, if you plug in this ansatz for that, you get coupled ordinary differential equations for these coefficients that the rate of change of a is, uh, proportional to A times B plus this, this constant scattering thing. And BDT is this, and the CDT is that, and then the, this, to, to make the whole thing normalize that the trace of the density matrix is one, and D has, has that form. So now you can get this to write it in, uh, while well, getting, getting rid of, simplifying the coefficients, you could choose a time coordinate that's multiplying by h bar and divided by m. So this tau has dimensions of L squared. It's, it's proportional to time, but it's scaled so that it has dimensions of length squared. And then I found it convenient to define a little lambda, which is 2m and the three will just for simplifying later. This has dimensions of L to the minus four, and then use a prime for a derivative with respect to tau, as Yosin Zay did. Then, then this equation becomes this. It, it, you, you can see you got rid of the M and stuff because of the prime. Uh, <clears throat> so you have these equations. So then, then there is explicit solutions in terms of one quantity I'll call capital X. It's, uh, you can see before, Yos and Zay have a G, which is eight, uh, eight times X. It's a little more convenient to, for me to rescale it. So you get, okay, so you get these, these three quantities here. Uh, <clears throat> And then, well, and then the normalization, where the x basically has is a cubic in in tau, and the leading term is determined by this lambda, which is determined by this this interaction 
coefficient. And then the other, the other three depend on your initial, con on the initial condition. So that at, at, at t equals zero, that what C and B and D are. Um, okay, so it turns out in this thing that the, the, R, the variance of the position, so the delta X quantity square is the same as this capital X. So it has this form and the variance in P I'll, I'll divide by H bar squared to give this to have dimensions of one over length squared. That's then a half X double prime. So that's three lambda tau plus A2. So therefore you can see at T equals zero, then these terms left. So it, at T equals zero, a, a naught is the rate, is the variance for X and A2 is the variance of P of the momentum divided by the square of Planck's constants. So we could write it, the, the equation in terms of the initial variance of X and P, and then there's another coefficient here. Now this coefficient, if you square it, it gets this. So I'm gonna make the, well, and it also turns out for the density matrix to be positive, A has to be bigger than C. And if you start bigger than C, or, or at least as big as C, it, it, the, it, it can never get smaller. So I'm gonna make, make, do a model where I have a simple onsets that you, you start off with a minimum uncertainty that, that delta X delta P is a, is a half H bar. Or so this takes its minimum value of one. So here, this takes the minimum value of one. <clears throat> and then because this it cannot be smaller than one, the only way for this to work is as if this is equal to one. And then, then, then this A1 would be zero. And then, so with that onset <clears throat> that the, this, this capital X, or, which is the same as the spread in the position is just given by the initial, well, because this is, because it's minimum uncertainty, it's just given by the initial spread of the, of the X. So <clears throat> then they, uh, okay. So that, then, then if you plug those in and put in that formulas and then write explicitly what the, what the A, B, and C, you can get explicit expressions for this. And you can also find that the eigenstates of this density matrix for uh, all non-negative integers in, they're, they're just the same form as, 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 a, as a thermal state for harmonic oscillator, I mean, as far as the, the eigenvalues. And so then, and the expectation value of this quote excitation number, it's, it's not really an excitation number, but is is given by this in terms of A and C, and the von Neumann entropy then is given by 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 this expression. So you can write that explicitly. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the, just do a toy model of a baseball, and so consider a baseball that's moving toward a batter at 100 miles per hour, which is exactly by the definition of miles and feet and so on, exactly 44.704 meters per second. And it turns out that's about the fastest that any pitcher can throw. There's been a few times that people have been recorded throwing a baseball faster than a, a bit faster, 100 miles per hour. But it's, and anyway, in the U.S. at least, it's it's kind of a 100 miles per hour is kind of a convenient number. And let's suppose that maybe this is batted, but there's some different amplitudes for the how the bat to be to be batted back at the same speed. And it turns out that this would have a momentum of one Planck unit. Uh, which is the Planck mass times C, which is this, with the, this is the uncertainty of the last two digits. If the mass of the baseball were this, which is about 5.15 ounces, and that happens to be just above the middle, it's the 59th percentile of the allowed range for, for legal baseball games, it's supposed to be between five and five and a quarter ounces. And so it's very near there. So, so to, assuming that the baseball is that, that a baseball 100 miles an hour has the Planck momentum. Now, of course, I'm also thinking about other things that have a Planck momentum. And we have our first granddaughter, Lydia, who was born August 5 with a mass of 3.747 kilograms. And so I calculate with a standard G, if she'd fallen 0.154 meters, which is 30% of her birth length, then she would also have had the Planck momentum, though that uh, uh, her, her uh, John and Liz, her parents are our son and daughter-in-law uh, didn't really allow me to do the experiment. But uh, anyway, so henceforth, I'll, I'll talk about the idealized motion of a baseball with this momentum instead of uh, motion of Lydia. So <clears throat> let's take this, let's take an idealized quantum state where it's moving in one spatial dimension. Of course, this is really idealized with zero mean momentum. So 
you know, the, the, it might be maybe the batter missed it. So it would go one way or the batter hit it and goes back the other way. But then also, of course, I'm assuming this Gaussian and initial RMS momentum, the Planck momentum and mean velocity, 100 miles per hour. And assuming, and let's take that the, it's a pure Gaussian. So with the uh, momentum variance being one Planck unit, then the position variance is a half of a Planck length. And then a baseball radius is about 0 0.0369 meters. And then, uh, and then include the effects of the US standard atmosphere at sea level in order to get this capital lambda. And then, and then I'm also going to take it to get a typical time. Uh, if it was batted at 45 degrees and there was no air friction, then it would go, it would, it would go for a time this time. So I've just got to put in those times. But of course, I'm assuming it's really going in one, one dimension. So this tau then comes out to be 5 times 10 to the minus 33 meters squared, or in Planck units, 2 times 10 to the 37. And then the lambda, you put in all these numbers, the mass of the baseball, the cross-section of the baseball, the mass of the average air molecule, the density of air, the, the velocity of uh, the mean velocity of air molecules divided by three times Planck constant cube. You get, you get that, or three times 10 to the 79 meters fourth, or that, with, and there's the, the, the Planck length. Okay, so then if we, uh, after this time, the idealized density matrix for the, for the baseball is, then this and this X has this, and in this, the leading, the, the dominant term is this one. And so that's this. And that really just gives the mean, if it, if it had gone for that time with a velocity of 100 miles per hour, then that just gives that. It's it, it, more precisely 288 meters, but to, to one digit that. And then A has these values in Planck units and delta P, it turns out this term which is basically what you what you'd get if it, if you didn't really include drag, but you have you had all these air molecules bouncing off it uh, at the at, with the same velocity. It would, that this would be like the Brownian motion, but that's that, that's down by twenty two orders of magnitude. So it basically stays at the Planck momentum. So, and then the the uh, if if you drop that if you drop that term from from here, and then well, this is the very tiny initial things. And this is basically the spread and the position just from the motion. So the, 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 the certainty of the position is basically the, the distance that it would go during this time at 100 miles per hour. Now, Yosin's A give the eigenstates of the density matrix as this. They look very much like harmonic oscillators, except there's this extra phase factor, which, which would mean that really they have much more energy. And if you put in the mass, then the oscillator period comes out to be 200,000 years uh, for this to be. It's, it's not, I'm just saying it, it is the same eigenstates if I drop this B as a harmonic oscillator with a baseball mass and a period of 200,000 years. And uh, then the expectation value for, the, for, the, or the, for this excitation number is about 10 to the 26. And so then the eigenvalues are going... <laughs> Well, they're essentially exponentially decreasing in in, and a von Neumann entropy that's around 61 for this thing. So the mean position is zero, but the variance of the position, if we look at each of the at each of the eigenstates, the variance in the in in the position, uh, you can write it's about two times 10 to the minus 11 meters squared times that. So for n equals zero, this is very small. So the, the n equals zero eigenstate of the density matrix is very highly localized. It's that. But, and that's the largest eigenvalue, but the, but the largest eigen is very tiny. It's, it's, it, it's like a thermal state with the thermal energy much, much higher than the ground state energy. But if you weight the variance over all eigenstates, since they, all of them have a mean position of zero, each eigenstate, then the, 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 the mean of that is just the same as the position variance of the full state. So that's 288 meters squared. So it's the eigenstates of this decoherent density matrix are I mean there's you know there there's a few that are have have small variants but but most of them have variants of the full state it, so it it doesn't the eigenstates do not explain observations with a relatively small uncertainty in the position in other words if we see the baseball to be localized much closer to that that's not really explained by by this and you might say well let's do some time averaging if you do time averaging then if there is this phase factor that changes by about two pi over this very short time. So if you could, you could average that out and then you drop the B term essentially, but still it's the, the position and the uncertainty in position is still, is still huge. 
uh, it's still it's still the same. It gives the same as before. So anyway, so this leads to the question of how do you it doesn't seem that 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 taking the eigenstates of of the density matrix even with decoherence that doesn't explain observations with small uncertainties. So to avoid observations with large uncertainties within each observation, as most of the eigenstates of the baseball density matrix row, or even its time average row bar over some relatively small time half, one might propose that observations are instead represented by Rel by relatively localized operators that are inherent in the ultimate theory, but independent of the quantum state density matrix. They're not eigenstates of this density matrix. There are some operators that are inherent in the theory. And then the measure, which is analogous to the probability of the kth observation, is the trace of this operator times the, the density matrix, the expectation by the operator in the quantum state of the universe. So if you just had a one-dimensional toy model of a universe of an object with position X, these could be narrow Gaussians. I mean, we don't know what they are, but they could be narrow Gaussians. And if that were the case, and then maybe each one has a different center, and then the measure of the kth operation, it would depend on the density matrix, mainly in a localized region surrounding this, if this gamma is sufficiently big and, and the alpha that, that the spread is small. Though it's another question how the, well the content of the observation would reflect the narrow uh, localization. So, so in conclusion, decoherence can greatly increase the von Neumann entropy of the density matrix of a subsystem interacting with its environment. But at least in this simple example such as this, it does not decrease the RMS positional spread in the eigenstates of that density matrix. So therefore by itself, it does not seem sufficient to explain the classicality of typical observations. The fact that they do not individually show the large quantum uncertainties that the quantum state usually has. So Zay's paper I quoted noted that, quote, a theory of measurement must necessarily be empty if it does not have a substitute for psychophysical parallelism. So I'm arguing that operators such as this A sub K whose expectation values give the measures for observations, and particularly if they're measures as sentient experience or conscious perceptions, that would be one some substitute. However, we do not yet know what these operators are. So even if we did learn the so-called theory of everything for the complete dynamics of the universe, which is not really a theory of everything, and even if we learn the quantum state of the universe, which would be the next big step toward getting that, we would still not have a complete theory for the universe until we had this, this substitute for psychophysical parallelism, or in other words, the connection to, to observations or sentient experiences which might, and I, as I've proposed elsewhere, might be given by the expectation values of, of a set of operators, one for each observation, but we don't know what those operators are. Okay, so with that, I'll close. All right, thank you very much, Don. That was actually really well timed. <laughs> All right, so before going to questions, congratulations on, on your granddaughter, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. So uh, thank you very much for the, for, the good, for the amazing talk. So now we're gonna go and uh, ask everybody that if you have questions, please raise your hand. Hopefully uh, you see the raising hand feature on Zoom. You can do that. Uh, if you can't, I would just ask you to ask for a muting yourself and ask, but uh, uh, we prefer that you use the raising hands. Now we have a question first uh, from Rob Mann. So Rob, you go first. Mute. There we go. Oh, that's not muted myself. So I can leave it. I, I can leave this on in case I need to go back to some other slide. Is that okay, or or do I need to go off? You can leave it on. You can leave it yeah, on. Yeah. I, I'm gonna let uh, you unmute yourself, Rob. Now you can unmute yourself. Uh, okay. Thanks, because I couldn't do that. Yeah. Thanks, Don. As usual, a very interesting and out of the way talk. What I what I mean, there's a number of things I could ask, but you show. So for a baseball you show that the uh, uh, spread in the eigenvalues doesn't decrease. Now, what I wondered was, does that have to do the, uh, <clears throat> with the size and, and other so-called classical parameters of the baseball? Or put another way, is there some distant scale that is shorter where, where this would work or larger, I'm not sure, I'm suspecting it's shorter. But anyway, is there some distance regime where decoherence will decrease the RMS positional spread, for example, 
or is this just generic no matter what distance scale you picked? Well, I think it's, it's, it's generic for this. If, if I had this Gaussian, if you have this Gaussian onsets for what the state is, and you had those, that, that, those equations that you said they had, then basically, well, I get. I guess you could. I. I, I guess you could see that. That, that clearly the. the there's a distance scale in the problem, and I couldn't follow uh, quickly enough where it was. But I'm just wondering if the use Z thing would work up to a certain distance scale, but it breaks down before we get to classicality, or no matter how large or how small I may like if I replace a baseball with Jupiter or a baseball with, with uh, a bacterium, am I still basically going to get the same problem? Yeah, you get to, at least with, 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 with those equations of that Gauss onset, then it, the RMS, it, the variance of the eigenstates is just the same as the, as the, as the, as the RMS variance of the full state. And so with, this well, is I, true no matter what the scale then. Yeah, basically. no matter what the scale. I mean, it's, okay. it, it's essentially because each eigenstate it, with this onset for what the state, each eigenstate has the same expectation value for X. So therefore the, the, the expectation value of X squared is, I mean, so let's suppose we, we, well, in this particular case, we chose the expectation value of X to be zero, but whatever it is, if you take that out, then the, then the expectation value of, of X, well, of X squared is it's the same as the variance. And if each eigenstate has the same expectation value, the variance for each, the average for it just comes out the same. So it's it's basically that. I don't know whether, you know, whether you could have some chaotic system. I, I don't really know whether there could be some systems in which the eigenstates, the different eigenstates have different expectation values for X. But in this case, they all have the same expectation value for X. So therefore the the, the average variance for each eigenstate is the same as the variance for the full state. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Rob. Alex, you can, I think, unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi, Don, thanks a lot for, uh, for that talk. Um, just before I ask my question, I just want to make uh, sort of a small clarifying thing to make sure I understand the punchline is, is that um, the problem or that you, you pose is that, um, we have this model of the baseball interacting with an environment. And if we tell the usual decoherence story that the variance and the eigenvalues of the reduced density matrix of say the baseball aren't small enough to explain sort of how localized we see the baseball to be. Is that the? Right, right. Okay. So my question then is um, like, how far does sort of these von Neumann measurement models go to um, answering your question in some sense, because I could, have say an interaction with the baseball that say measures its position. So I would have described the measuring apparatus as a quantum system. And I have a specific, a very specific interaction that couples that apparatus with the position of the baseball such that when I, after, you know, this measurement interaction happens, I can just look at the, you know, I can trace out the, the, the baseball and just look at the apparatus itself. And, and if I now make a measurement of sort of the position of in cor that's correlated now with the position of the baseball, the variance in that measurement could be small. So I could construct such, such interactions and then construct, I guess, wow. AKs would be associated with the effect operators that, the, the, that this measurement model would define or something like that. So how but far I mean, would if, that go to answering that? Yeah. But I mean, if the, if the apparatus is correlated with the baseball, it's going to also have a spread in apparatus result in, in the record in the apparatus. Right. But can so we prepare the spread really small um, and sort of engineer the dynamics of the apparatus so that spread doesn't disperse? Well, if the spread doesn't disperse, it's not going to give a result that depends on what the baseball is doing. I mean, in other words, if, if, you, if you really want to allow your apparatus to give different records for different positions of the baseball, then there has to be the possibility for the apparatus to have these, you know, they have to have the possibility for these different states. And so it's you're, you're going to end up with a, you know, the, the, it's going to interact with it and, and it becomes correlated. So the apparatus now becomes a mixed state with, with the different values of the, rec of the recorded. Of the right. recording. And so that I'm saying that's going to, that's going to still be spread. It's not, it's the, there's no, you know, I'm assuming unitary evolution. So those collapse of the wave function, any single one of these 
of, of, of these eigenstates is going to be the full, you know, the full mixed state with all of them. And so the, the yeah, it's, it's basically saying that, that, that if you have the apparatus, then the, the, the uncertainty, the uncertainty that was originally in the measured system then goes into the uncertainty of what the apparatus record is. I see. Um, okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Alex. Are there any more questions from the audience? I think you can now, if you were, if you were trying to ask a question but couldn't because couldn't raise your hand, you can unmute yourself and ask now. All right, if there aren't any more questions, I'm, I'm gonna ask a question myself. So Don, this is, I found it really interesting. That there's um, something that I, uh, I mean, I understand the, the general reasoning uh, also because uh, your answer to, to Alex was uh, clarifying on that. But there are, there are some of the things that are difficult for me to, to kind of go with. Like the, 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 the coherence that would happen in the system would have to be related with, obviously, uh, with the kind of interaction with the environment, right? So uh, it is conceivable, perhaps, that there could be an interaction with the environment so that the uncertainty is reduced and put in the environment. No? I mean, the interaction can swap uncertainties to the environment. And the uncertainty may go into observables of the environments that, by definition, are not the things that are we going to measure. So is that is that possible? Do you think it's possible to build a model in which <laughs> the, the way in which it happens is because you increase the uncertainty of the environment, which was already uncertain to begin with, or something like that along those lines? Well, it, yeah, it might be. I mean, certainly, you know, certainly this was a very simple, you know, simple onsets for how they couple. And I don't know. It's it, it might be an interesting question if you had a some sort of a chaotic system could it you know it, 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 could it be that the eigenstates do become localized and, and then they, they just have the, the different eigenstates then would have different expectation values of the position and you know if that's possible then of course it, 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 it is possible that that the the variance of the because the variance of the, of the different eigenstates would be about a different mean then the then the variances could on average be less but here since the mean stayed the same so I don't know. I mean, I you know I can't rule out that maybe there is. It would be very interesting to know. You know, are there some models for, for yeah, that? I, but I, but I guess I have some skepticism that it really that it really that what you what you actually observe really depends on the eigenstates of this thing because that that would be that's a very nonlinear aspect of the quantum state what the eigenstates are. So to me, it just seems simpler to suppose that. To postulate that there there are some operators for each possible observation, and the expectation value of that operator gives the measure of, I mean, to me that even seems simpler than to, than the saying that well you you have this thing and you try to, you have to find then the eigenstates of this density matrix, which is a very nonlinear aspect of a quantum state. You know what's the eigen what's the what are the eigenstates? Right. Is this is the, I guess my, my question was inspired by the way in which uh, uh, people who work in, um, in do experiments and try to model the coherence in their experiments, the way the effective models that they do making several assumptions on environments, those those uh, Markovianity, et cetera, et cetera, those models tend to destroy coherence in, in a particular way that uh, that uh, uh, would also localize the system. Of course, those are that's, those are ad hoc models. They're not uh, the kind of fundamental reasoning that you're doing here, but. Uh, I would assume that there's a way, if, if you know what uh, master equation you want to end with, there may be a way to, to uh, postulate what will be the interaction with the environment so that uh, uh, it does the right decoherence. And then we can look at and ask, okay, what is the kind of interaction that we need in order to do this? And I, I was wondering if, if, if you know if anybody's looking to that or what you think. I Yeah, I do. I mean, I've kind of just gotten into this and th th this is something I was working on and I didn't even have it written up for, well, I still don't have it written up for a paper. Yeah. So, it, yeah, I, it, I can imagine it could be very interesting, but I have not, I've just barely got far enough to give this talk. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, I don't have any more questions. Uh, there's still time for discussion. If uh, you have a follow up question. Uh, oh, okay. I see Ralph. That's good. I can breathe now. Okay, so the, there's, I have a, one question though, it's not related to as much to, to the talk, but I saw that you have a katana behind you. Is, this, is there a story with that? Are you, are you, uh, are you good at sword fighting? Uh, <laughs> no, I guess, <laughs> yeah, this was, uh, 
<laughs> I don't know. I can, I can pull it out. <laughs> Hopefully, nobody feels threatened over the internet. That was a good backdrop. <laughs> it was great. Nobody has the. Uh, I guess I have heard, heard uh, 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 conspiracy theorists that think that the uh, coronavirus could spread over five G networks. So. <laughs> <laughs> As a conspiracy theory, I heard. Yeah, no, the, we we visited. I uh, I was visiting my student Sangpo Kim in, in South Korea, and then we and my whole family came and we went on to China, and my sons bought one of these in Beijing or something. Then it turned out we were going back to North Korea, or sorry, not North Korea, South South Korea, and they wouldn't allow us to take it into the into the country. And so we had to leave at the airport and then we could, and then we were supposed to be able to pick it up on the way out, but then they wanted to charge a huge fee. And it turned out we were going back to China. So my son, that was, the fee was bigger than the device. So we did. So anyway, we went back to, back to China and my sons bought these things and it's hanging up in the basement where they used to hang out with their kids before they moved out. So it's, I don't know much about them other than uh, what my son said, but they, there is, Cora has some, has some, uh, YouTube about breakthroughs in physics, and apparently they they had interviewed me about the black hole information puzzle and stuff, and a huge fraction of the comments were about these katanas. <laughs> I believe mean, it. <laughs> so I, one of one of them says, "Me, Dog Page talks talks about boring, confusing physics, or, or no, Don Page talks about boring physics. Me, I noticed the katana on the wall. <laughs> Don Page talks deep." Deep, interesting physics. <laughs> so somehow it seemed to have an effect on. Huh? <laughs> physics, but I also asked about the katana. So both are possible. <laughs> and somebody okay. else said, somebody else said that, that it's a good guard against flat, flat earthers coming into the physics. <laughs> lab. Although this, of course, is at home. I don't go into the physics. Lab. Fair enough. All right. So. Uh, Thank you very much, Don. That was uh, that was a great talk. I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, uh, because we have a little bit of time um, extra, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple of topics that I didn't do before because uh, we I wanted to start in time. Maybe uh, Thales, you can stop recording now to save space so we can focus on the science for the recordings. All right. So our next speaker today is Russ Suthol, also someone that we know very well in the circles of uh, relativistic quantum information, a professor in the Hauptmann Center in uh, dresden Rosendorf. Uh, so, Ralph, I think uh, the floor is yours. You can start whenever you want. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay, fine. Yeah, so, uh, oh yeah, let's first, uh, uh, let me first join the other speaker to thank the organizers for putting up this effort into organizing this online workshop. I'm, I'm very look forward to uh, the time when all this is uh, passed and we can meet in person each other again. But okay, now for now it's probably the best, the best we can do. And let me try to do a, a giving a talk via Zoom where I don't have much experience yet. Okay, so my talk is on the Heisenberg limit. And the main uh, question is that often in physics you want to measure some very, very small quantities which are quite hard to measure. And the question is, what is the basic requirement to measure these small quantities? Or I'll put it another way, you have these laws of quantum mechanics you cannot beat. So what, what do the laws of quantum mechanics dictate? What is the necessary requirements to measure some very, very small quantities? And here to be more precise, let me start with some very specific example, which is the Euler-Heisenberg Lagrangian. That's basically if you take the full QED Lagrangian and say, okay, the electrons are all in the QED uh, vacuum state Dirac C, but still they are not totally gone. If you integrate them out, then you get the effective Lagrangian for the remaining electromagnetic fields with this Euler Heisenberg Lagrangian. And here I just plotted the one to lowest order in alpha QED and assuming that the wavelengths and all the scales for the electromagnetic fields are much, much below the electron mass. So a low energy, uh, low coupling expansion. And then your effective Lagrangian is basically the usual one, you know, from, from electrodynamics, classical electrodynamics, and then some additional terms where you have these quartic uh, powers in the field strengths. And you see, if you look at the prefactor in front, this is a very small quantity. So unless you have huge fields, which are very hard to reach, this will be a very, very tiny effect. And in fact, for say long, uh, 
normal electromagnetic fields like plane waves also uh, this effect of the other Heisenberg regression has not been measured yet. So now the question would be, what would it take to measure it? And there we say, okay, let's take one field, which is which I call the pump field, which is E0 and B0 electric and magnetic field from the pump field. That is a strong field, say from a laser, for example, and that modifies the vacuum, polarizes the vacuum a little bit. And then I use another field, which is E1 and B1, which is weaker, but still quite strong. We will come to some, some numbers later on. That I have one I call the probe fields. And then I insert everything. And I say, okay, the pump field I consider as given and then see what is the effective Lagrangian for the probe field. And after linearization, you get the following effective Lagrangian for your probe fields E1 and B1 where you have these little change in the dielectric permittivity over here, delta epsilon, little change of the magnetic polarizability or permittivity, uh, permeability, delta mu. And in general, you also get some symmetry breaking term, which is usually called uh, delta psi. So these are all matrices and they are now in this effective Lagrangian, which means that the pump field E0 and B0 um, uh, tell you that the vacuum behaves like an effective medium, and then you can measure that or see this by the probe field E1 and B1. And just to give you a, uh, oh yeah, sorry, here there are two pictures from Euler and Heisenberg, and here's sort of the lowest order Feynman di diagram where you get these lowest order contribution for the, for the fields from. And you say in PV last type experiments, you consider a static magnetic field in, of some, some Tesla, and then this psi actually vanishes and you have only delta epsilon, delta mu, and they are on the order of 10 to minus 22. So you can see this is very hard to measure and uh, uh, yeah, you need the same sort of accuracy as for the gravitational waves at LIGO. Another idea would be to use a very strong laser, the focus of a very strong laser beam. There you can reach much, much higher field strengths and say if, with present day te technology, you can have a 10 to 22 watts per square centimeter intensity at the focus. And then if you plug in these fields, then you have delta epsilon, delta mu, and also a delta psi of 10 to minus 11. It's still a very tiny quantity, but the question would be, how can you measure this? And then for example, the vacuum in the presence of such a field would behave like a medium and show reflective uh, behavior by refringents and so on. So everything you know from, a, from an ordinary medium is also now in the vacuum. And the question is, how to measure that. Okay, so then it's good to go to a Hamiltonian picture. You take the momentum, which is just the dielectric displacement field D. And then you see you have one plus epsilon, delta epsilon electric field, plus a little mixture from the magnetic field as well. And then you get the Hamiltonian for the probe field. And now I drop these E1 and B1. So this is all E and B now is, is, is just the probe field. And then you get your following Hamiltonian over here. And you see, you can split off the usual Hamiltonian, which is just P squared plus B squared. And then the rest is delta epsilon, delta mu, and delta psi. And all these terms I call the interaction Hamiltonian, which then is the interaction between the pump and the probe field. And the question is, can you measure this interaction? That is, can you measure the, uh, the, the, the vacuum behaves like an effective medium? So now there are different ways to say that, but uh, what is clear, I think, is that if you take the quantum state of the probe field, that before the measurement or before the interaction, it is just psi. Then you have the interaction with the interaction Hamiltonian. And then the state should change sufficiently strongly compared to the initial state. And one way of putting this is to say this no signal fidelity over here should deviate from unity. If it's unity, then the initial and the final state are basically the same and you cannot distinguish them and you cannot measure the whole effect. But if you want to have some measurable effect, the minimum requirement is to say that this fidelity here should deviate from unity from one. And now let's say, okay, insert the time evolution operator, say the interaction Hamiltonian is a very weak quantity, which is true in our case and make just look at the lowest order contribution, make a Taylor expansion here, you see that the Fidelity is unity plus I times phi, where phi is then the phase coming from this interaction Hamiltonian plus higher order terms. And now if you say the interaction Hamiltonian is small, I drop these higher order terms and say the lowest order 
in the change of this fatality is this phase shift phi, which is basically the time integral of the expectation value of this interaction Hamiltonian or the space time integral of this interaction Hamiltonian density over here. And now the question is, what would be the requirement to have a, a phase shift, which is not too small, that is that, that you can measure the effect. So we want to have an upper bound, derive an upper bound for the phase shift and then say, okay, this is the minimum you have to do. Otherwise the phase shift is so small and you cannot measure the effect. And that's what we want to do here. And first we say, okay, First, we treat the uh, probe field also as a classical field. I will come to quantum fields later. So just say at the moment, we have the classical field and then the interaction Hamiltonian density is just basically the pi field with the perm uh, uh, permittivity tensor, B field with the permeability tensor and this symmetry breaking contribution over here. And now we want to make the space-time integral of that and want to estimate, make an upper bound. Okay. So delta epsilon, that's very nice. This is symmetric. So I can diagonalize the whole thing and say I can estimate this product over here, pi delta epsilon pi by pi squared and the matrix normal of delta epsilon, which is basically the absolute value of the largest eigenvalue of this delta epsilon matrix. You can do the same thing for delta mu. And then you already have an estimate of the first two terms here of this interaction Hamiltonian which is basically pi squared and b squared. And then you take the maximum of the two uh, matrix norms of delta epsilon and delta mu, and they can be calculated if you insert your, your pump field. And then you see this p squared plus b squared, this is just the local energy density of the probe field. And then you can do the same thing with this delta psi, but this is not symmetric. So you cannot just simply, usually it's not, it cannot be simply diagonalized but then we can do the same thing instead of diagonalization, we just do the singular value decomposition of psi, where you just do the same thing, but with the left and right eigenvectors of psi, and then you have the analog of the eigenvalues, which are now the singular values sigma. And then you could, can do the same thing and bound the whole thing by this maximum, uh, sorry, yeah, by this bracket. So they take all the singular values, take the maximum of these two matrix norms, then take the maximum of the whole thing over the whole space. And then we can uh, put everything out of the integral. And then what we have remaining, we are left with the phase, which is smaller or equal, maximum equal to the total interaction time. That means the, the total time with interaction with pump and probe field times this uh, a maximum of all these eigenvalues here. And then the uh, spatial integral of the energy density just gives you the total energy of your um, probe field. So we have a bound of the phase in terms of interaction time, the total probe pulse energy and all these uh, singular values and, and eigenvalues. And that is basically then what, what I would call the Heisenberg limit for this uh, specific measurement that you can say you can bound the phase by Ralph, this. Ralph, we have a question from the audience. Are you- Oh yeah, sorry, yes. Okay, so Alice, I'm gonna let Alison unmute themselves. You can go now, Alison. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, it, it seems to me that it is, but I just want to verify, is this a, a tight bound? Can this be saturated? Um, good question. Let's see. I mean, for these, uh, they, I mean, there are several, there are several inequalities in here. I mean, for this delta epsilon, in principle, you just take the, the pi field in the direction of the biggest eigenvalue. So that can be saturated. Then now it depends what the what the direction of delta mu is, since for ordinary plane wave E and B are, are orthogonal. So if, if if delta epsilon and delta mu are not the eigenvalue, uh, sorry, the eigenvectors are not orthogonal, could be tough. And uh, yeah, and, and, and even a bit more complicated is if the delta psi. And then the rest is, let's see, then we have this maximum over here, but let's assume that that they are all constant, delta epsilon, delta mu. Uh, yeah, I would say not not in general, but in special cases, I would say you can probably saturate uh, this uh, this bound. But in general, it's a real bound, so it's a real inequality over here. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, oh yeah. So okay. So we have our phase, which we know should not be too small to be uh, for the whole effect to be measurable, and then we have a bound in the interaction time 
total energy of the, prowl, of the uh, probe pulse, and then this stuff, which is then giving you uh, the, your uh, uh, properties, the medium properties of, your, of the vacuum. Okay. So this is then what I call the Heisenberg limit, and we can turn it around. If you want to measure this, the phase over here should not be too small, which gives you putting the argument around um, a bound on the energy. So the energy of the probe pulse should be larger than this quantity over here, which is one over interaction time, and then one over this maximum of all these values over there. Okay, so we know if you want to measure this effect, you need just from the laws of quantum mechanics, a probe pulse, which has at least a certain energy. And just let's as a, uh, plug in these numbers I showed you for the laser focus. So the laser focus is the pump field, makes your vacuum like a medium. And then what would you be needing for the probe pulse? And then if you plug everything in, you get 10 to the 10 electron volts, which means if you have optical photons would be 10 to the 10 photons roughly, or 10 to minus nine joule. So this is already a lot, but this is uh, actually not a problem to, to generate. Um, in the lab, we have pulses which are much, much bigger than those. But the problem is, this is still the Heisenberg limit. I mean, this is still the total lower bound. To actually measure such a phase, you would need a highly non-classical state, such as a noon state, where all these 10 to the 10 photons over here are then, say, uh, in some interferometric uh, device, either taking or either all n photons take the left path, or all n photons take the right path. And then with such a very non-classical state, you can actually try to reach this Heisenberg limit. Problem is, this is very non-classical and very hard to produce if you have a huge number of photons. I mean, they are, they are doing now these new states for order 10 photons or so, but here we have 10 to the 10, so it's different. If you have a usual laser field, then the state you would have is more like a coherent state where each photon separately either takes one or the other path and then the total state is a product. And then actually, if you plug in everything, doesn't, you, doesn't allow you to reach this Heisenberg limit. It actually only allows you to reach the Poisson limit, which is the usual short noise limit or the usual uh, yeah, standard quantum limit or what you call it. And that has a very different scaling. So over here, if we say it in the Heisenberg limit, the phase using this noon state the phase for n photons is basically n times, n is the photon number, the phase for one photon, or putting this around, the phase accuracy scales as one over photon number. And then if you want to measure this with XFEL photons, which is the current proposal, you would need a million XFEL photons, which would not be a problem at all. But you would need them in this highly non-classical noon state, and this is very hard to reach. Instead, with this classical state here, you have the Poisson or short noise limit where the accuracy actually scales as one of the square root of number of photons. And then you see roughly you need 10 to the 12 XFEL photons. Oh, sorry, XFEL is X-ray free electron laser. So this is sort of the uh, most intense source for X-rays at the moment. And to reach such a pulse is already quite tough. This is possible, but it's quite tough. And this is actually the number they want to use in these experiments to measure these um, vacuum, the behavior that the vacuum behaves as a medium, where you actually use the Poisson short noise limit. Then if you, I have a warning that uh, technically five minutes left, but you can definitely bite into the question time. If you oh, sorry. Need. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Keep, keep it in mind because the more time, the, the, the shorter that you take, the more questions. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. All right. So if you plug this in, then you get huge, uh, much, much bigger energies, but they are just, at, at, uh, just possible uh, with present day technology. Okay. So now, Let's, I, so far this was for uh, classical fields. Now let's have a look at the, what happens if you use quantum fields instead. So first problem is of course, all these expectation values are infinite. So you have to renormalize the whole thing. And here let's just do the renormalization. If you subtract the vacuum, then we can use a normal mode decomposition of our pi fields, for example. So these are the pi i momentum, momentum per mode. Here is then a matrix element with the eigenfunction and permittivity tensor. And then we have the matrix over here. And then in principle, on the operator level, you can derive a formal bound, which looks quite, in the, uh, looks quite the same for these operators over here. So you have the matrix norm M of this matrix, which is basically the same matrix I had before. And then you have PI squared. 
And then you can estimate this or make a bound saying this is smaller than PI squared plus omega I squared QI squared, which means this is the matrix norm time H zero. But this is, even though it's a nice bound on the operator level, it's not really useful. And if you take the expectation value, this is infinite. And the problem is if you subtract the vacuum expectation value over there, then you cannot derive this bound since now the renormalized expectation values here, they can also be negative. So you cannot do this. For example, if you have a squeeze state, the PI squared expectation value can be smaller than in vacuum, which means that the PI squared renormalized expectation value is negative. So in principle, you could even beat this bound I derived before with quantum fields if you use many modes and squeeze them all a little bit with a little squeezing parameter psi, then you get your phase shift, which is a sum over all psi, all squeezing parameters, whereas the energy or the renormalized expectation value of the energy scales with the sum psi i squared. So in principle, you could get a large phase shift with almost no uh, expectation value of the energy. So for quantum fields, this bound doesn't work and you can use these infinite zero point energy to actually violate this bounds, but this is to use this in a real practical experiment is even harder than what we had before, but I think this is just a theoretical possibility. Okay, as a second example, let me just come to another case where we want to measure uh, gravitational waves. So you have the, the metric for gravitational wave in usual propagating in Z direction in this uh, fixed polarization, which is just the X polarization and in this uh, TT transverse traceless gauge. And then if you plug everything in and want to measure this with a Bose-Einstein condensate, which, which has been discussed in, in the past here, then you get the following uh, interaction Hamiltonian, spatial integral H is the gravitational wave. Then you have the interaction term where you have the dx dx term minus dy dy for this special metric and then possible changes for how the potential changes if the gravitational wave passes by. And there in the same, exactly the same wave, you can then derive at an upper bound for the phase, which is again bounded by total interaction energy, the maximum amplitude for this gravitational wave. Then this term here, if you make a plus and add the Z term, this is the total kinetic energy of your Bose-Einstein condensate. These are all positive, so you can make a bound. And then the maximum of this change of the interaction potential times the integral over this guy. And this is basically the total number of atoms in your BEC. So you have the same, you can also again arrive at a, a Heisenberg limit for your phase. And you see the maximum accuracy for detecting gravitational waves over here in principle scales with one over the number of condensate atoms. And then if you look at the scales, gravitational waves typically of a scale 10 to minus 22. Number of atoms in a BEC is 10 to the nine till, yeah, depending on how big you can make it. So you see there's still a large gap. And um, that's maybe not too surprising since if you, even if you look at LIGO with these huge long arms, they have 10 to the nine photons to measure these 10 to minus 22 effects. So you see you need a large, a large number of, of particles to really overcome this. And then maybe just as a speculation, maybe instead of a atomic Bose-Einstein condensate with a small number of atoms, maybe you could sup use superfluid helium where it's easier to reach a much, much larger or higher number of atoms. But of course, still you have to then to see how to measure this in, in superfluid helium. Okay, and then let me come to my conclusions. So I discussed the Euler-Heisenberg-Lagrangian and showed that the vacuum acts like an as an effective medium. And to lowest order, you get a phase shift, which you could measure by interferometry, interferometric means, sorry, for example. And if I insert classical probe fields, I, ins I get a Heisenberg limit for this phase, which scales with n, whereas the Poisson limit would scale with the square root of n, n is the number of photons here. And if you consider fully quantum fields, you can even violate this bound by making use of the infinitely many modes and the infinite zero point energy. If you do, the, oh, sorry, this is the paper where all this is described. And you can do the same thing for seeing how gravitational waves might be measured with both Einstein condensates. You get a similar bound and you also see that you need uh, yeah, very large scales to actually measure these gravitational waves. And maybe as an outlook, so so far I 
spoke about these no signal fidelity, which is sort of the most easy thing you can look at. Of course, there are much uh, further, uh, more involved concepts like quantum Fisher information. And there I just make a short point onto our recent paper with Dennis Retzel over here. And I think Dennis will also give a talk about this paper later in the conference. So I don't talk about this at the moment. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rolf. Thank you for the talk. <laughs> now, uh, if anybody has any questions, please uh, raise your hands and I'll, and I'll give you permission to unmute yourselves. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and give you, okay. Yeah, there's a question by Alison. So you got permission to unmute yourself. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Um, this is perhaps a, a very naive question. Um, so I, I get sort of mathematically what you mean by the difference between a classical probe field and a quantum probe field. And I was wondering if you could just speak to what you mean by that in terms of an, like an experiment, because I'm a theoretician and so I don't know. I mean, mathematically, I just said that here, uh, you see, it, this is a principle, the induction Hamiltonian is an operator. So this would be also operators. So, but I said, okay, at the moment, uh, I would say these, these, uh, the probe field I consider as classical. So instead of an operator, this is just a number over here. So this is from this point of view is the, is sort of what I mean uh, mathematically by classical and quantum fields. And uh, uh, from the experimental point of view, usually these uh, classical laser fields where you have many, many photons in one mode, that is that all the, all the expectation values and so on, you can, approximate them by this classical electromagnetic field. So it's just a highly excited coherent state in one special mode. Then usually you say that all of these expectation values can be approximated well by the classical field description. So you take a laser field with many, many photons in one mode and that can be approximated well by a classical field. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I mean. But again, then if you have quantum fields, then you see ah, in, in if you do it real, you have operators, you know, there are many modes and each mode has its own zero point energy, own quantum fluctuations and really making use of all these many modes, then you could actually violate this bound I derived for classical fields uh, for, for, for quantum fields. But doing this in a real experiment is, I think, then much, much harder than, uh, yeah, than already these highly non-classical moon states for reaching the Heisenberg limit. So actually violating the Heisenberg limit is, I think, experimentally even more challenging. But okay. I see. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Are there any more questions? All right, I'm gonna, you are now allowed to unmute yourself in case you're having troubles finding the hands, just in case. Any more questions? All right, so if there are any more questions, let's thank Ralph again. Ralph, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I clap uh, on behalf of the audience because uh, the audience can't. <laughs> All right, thanks so much. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, maybe we can stop the recording, uh, Dallas. Uh, so our next speaker today is Shadi Ali Hamad. Uh, if I mispronounce your name, please do correct me, which is probably true. Uh, from uh, Dartmouth College, and uh, he's a PhD student there, correct? Undergraduate. Right. And uh, he's going to uh, tell us about vacuum entanglement in the presence of gravitational waves. Floor is yours. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you all for joining, and thank you particularly to the organizers of this event. Um, the title of my talk is Vacuum Entanglement in the Presence of Gravitational Waves, and it's based on work I've done with Ju Dong Ju and Alexander Smith at Dartmouth. And the results I'm gonna be sharing here today with you can also be found in this PRD. Okay, so to start off the talk with a bit of motivation as to what the questions we're trying to answer here are, um, let's consider a gravitational wave background and define a quantum field theory, a matter field living on this uh, gravitational wave space time. And we wanna ask, how do you operationally probe entanglement in the field states? We know from standard quantum information science how to oper operationally probe entanglement in quantum mechanical states, for instance, and we would like to extend that to Fox states. And that will allow us to um, essentially 
say how gravitational waves can affect um, this affect this entanglement structure um, for a field state. Okay, so um, let's start off by setting up the field theory. Um, for that, we fix the gravitational wave background given by this line element. Here, A is the gravitational wave amplitude. Omega is its frequency, and it propagates in the z direction. For simplicity, we don't consider any off-diagonal terms in the metric, so no cross-polarization. Um, and for what comes in the next slide, we express it in light cone coordinates um, so that the line element looks like this. OK, and so now we want to choose the matter field living on this gravitational wave space time. And for that, we choose a non-minimally coupled, coupled scalar field whose equation of motion is given by this. And R here is the Ricci scalar, which vanishes for gravitational waves. Um, so this term goes to zero. And to simplify things even further, um, we consider a massless scalar field so that the Klein-Gordon equation just reduces to this, where the box is the Dalimbertian um, of the space time. And so the, the, the reason that we move to light cone coordinates um, in the previous slide is because we already know a convenient uh, basis of solutions for this classical equation of motion, which will help us represent the quantum field in, in that uh, in, in a basis with the coefficients being the classical solutions. Uh, and why would we do that? Well, we want to talk about correlations ultimately. And so um, in particular, uh, we're interested in the Whiteman function, which is defined as this um, vacuum expectation value of this product of two operators. And if we decompose the field operators in uh, mode sum expansion, um, we can write the Whiteman function as an integral over momentum of the classical solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation from the previous slide. And so really the, the first novel result of this work is that you can take that expression and expand it to first order in the gravitational wave amplitude, and the integral is analy analytically solvable. So we get that the Whiteman function for a gravitational wave spacetime um, decomposes into this Minkowski standard Weidman function and uh, linear in a gravitational wave contribution to, uh, to that. And so now we, we fix our curved background and defined our quantum field theory. And we know how to talk about correlation functions for this uh, quantum field as a consequence of being in this curved background. Um, so the, the initial question was, how do you probe entanglement in the field states? And for that, we need to perform some kind of measurement. And as with any general measurement, you introduce an auxiliary um, system, uh, the detector here, that's coupled to the field through some interaction Hamiltonian. And then it'll allow us to um, read off information about the field uh, by perform performing measurements on the detector. And so to make this uh, more precise, we employ the under DeWitt detector model, where the detector is just a simplified two-level atom with energy f omega. And it moves along some classical trajectory in the ambient space, uh, parameterized by its proper time. And the detector couples to the scalar field through this following interaction, Hamiltonian. Lambda is a coupling constant. Chi is a switching function, so it determines the temporal extent of the interaction of the detector with the field. The sigmas are ladder operators for that two-level system. And it, as you can see, it's coupled to the field operator evaluated along the trajectory of the detector. Um, and so it's a local interaction. OK. Uh, is there a... OK. Um, and so now the natural question is, what can you do with one detector? And so for that, let's suppose that you start off the detector in its ground state and the field is in its vacuum state. And you apply this evolution channel as uh, prescribed by the interaction Hamiltonian from the previous slide. And you get this evolved uh, bipartite state of the detector and the field. And then you throw away the field degrees of freedom um, to arrive at a reduced state for the detector modified as a consequence of its interaction uh, with the field. And so um, 
here, uh, the reduced state depends on P sub D, this P sub D term. Um, and that's the transition probability of the detector um, given as an integral over the Whiteman function of the field theory, which is essentially the probability that the detector will uh, transition from its ground to excited state as a consequence of vacuum fluctuations. Okay. Um, and so specifically to the gravitational wave background we were considering, if you fix this time-like stationary trajectory, um, we find, which is a geodesic for both Minkowski and uh, the gravitational wave space time, we find that the gravitational wave contribution to the transition probability from the previous slide um, actually vanishes. And so this is, uh, this leads us to conclude that gravitational waves don't affect detector transitions uh, within this specific detector model. And this is consistent with Gibbon's result from 1975, which states that there can be no particle production in a gravitational wave background. Uh, but the way Gibbons arrived at that result is by considering a sandwich gravitational wave space time. So it's asymptotically Minkowski in both directions. And he uh, calculated the beta Bogolyubov coefficient um, between the in and out regions and found that to be zero. Okay, so now the question is, um, what can you do with two detectors? Because uh, with two detectors, you can talk about correlations and entanglement, which is our primarily goal, primary goal in this um, work. And so the, the picture just becomes you have two detectors, A and B, coupled to the field uh, over some curved background. And each one has its own uh, interaction Hamiltonian. And the question now is, what happens to the reduced state of the uh, two detectors after interacting with the field? So you repeat the same analysis, uh, but we assume that the two detectors initially start off in a separable state. So there's no entanglement initially. Uh, they're both in their ground states, and the field is in its vacuum state. And then we apply the evolution channel on this initial state um, to get an evolved tripartite state now for two detectors and the field. And then we trace over the Fox space um, to get the reduced state of the two detectors A and B. And we get an X state because of its form. And uh, you'll see here there's two new matrix elements. Um, that are going to be important um, because what we'd like to do is to, we know from quantum information science that uh, we can read off uh, correlations or entanglement from this um, reduced state. And we'd like to attribute um, that entanglement or correlations to the vacuum state of the field uh, because they're, they were coupled to it. Um, and to do that, we employ the entanglement harvesting protocol which essentially states that if the two detectors, A and B, remain space-like separated throughout their interaction with the field, then any entanglement in this reduced state um, has had to have come from the vacuum state of the field because if they're space-like, then there is no way for them to generate that entanglement or correlations um, in the, their reduced state. And this plays on the theme uh, of previous and current work. Um, of encoding space-time structure in vacuum entanglement structure of a field theory. So for instance, we have the Versi and Menicucci paper where they perform this kind of analysis for an FLRW um, space-time. And we have Martin Martinez, Smith and Terno uh, paper where they perform this analysis to all orders of perturbation for um, general uh, curved backgrounds admitting a well-defined Whiteman function. And so, um, so we need to be able to read off correlations and entanglement in this um, bipartite state. And in this work, we use um, two measures, the concurrence as an entanglement measure, which depends on x and the transition probabilities. And for total correlations, we use this correlation function, uh, which depends on both x and c. So to be able to talk about entanglement or correlations, we need to know what happens to the matrix elements X and C as a consequence of being in a gravitational wave background. And so we can look at each element on its own. The matrix element X, also given as an integral over the Weidman function, um, 
we can fix the these two trajectories, which basically state that the two detectors A and B are separated by this capital D um, separation parameter. And what we find analytically that the gravitational wave contribution to the matrix element X is even in the detector energy gap, which is taken to be the same for both A and B for simplicity. And that just tells us that um, X, the gravitational wave contribution to the matrix element X doesn't discriminate between detectors in the ground uh, versus excited state, for instance. And uh, for the matrix element C, what we find is that um, the gravitational wave contribution to the matrix element C for these same trajectories um, does not have that um, symmetry or invariance as X. So in general, it will be sensitive to the sign of the detector energy gap. Okay, um, so now we wanna use the entanglement. So now we know what X and C, uh, how they change as a consequence of being in the gravitational wave background. And we wanna use our measures of entanglement and correlations um, to, to be able to employ that entanglement harvesting protocol I discussed um, previously. And so here there, we plot the concurrence of the reduced state of the two detectors made dimensionless as a function of the detector uh, separation and the detector energy gap um, for both Minkowski and gravitational wave. So here there's no gravitational wave. And in these two plots, there is a gravitational wave. It's on a gravitational wave background. Um, and in the middle plot compared to Minkowski, we find that the concurrence is less. Um, so we conclude that the, concur the entanglement as detected by the concurrence for this parameter space is degraded uh, with respect to Minkowski. And conversely here for in this parameter space, the entanglement is enhanced with respect to Minkowski. The only variable between these two uh, plots is this parameter T naught. And T naught is essentially the parameter that shows up in the switching function in the interaction Hamiltonian, which determines the peak interaction time that uh, the detector and the field interact compared to where the gravitational wave is in its cycle, because the gravitational wave is also um, oscillating at a frequency small omega. And so to zoom in on this effect even further, we can break up the concurrence into a Minkowski part and a gravitational wave contribution. And we can plot the a ladder for both time-like and space-like separated detectors as a function of the gravitational wave frequency for different energy gaps, detector energy gaps. And what we find for T naught equals zero that we have negative um, contributions in this parameter space. So this is consistent with the middle plot from the previous slide where the entanglement is degraded with respect to Minkowski. And for T naught equals one, um, we have that the contribution to the concurrence from the gravitational wave is mainly positive. So we expect that the entanglement is enhanced with respect to Minkowski. And this is also consistent with the third plot from two slides ago. Uh, but more interestingly, we have this, uh, in both of these slides, we have an interesting um, resonance effect that um, can be tracked as, as we increase the detector energy gap. Um, and it's consistent with the condition that the gravitational wave frequency is twice the energy gap of the detectors. And in fact, we can also predict this analytically from the expressions of uh, the concurrence. Shadi, just so you know, it's five minutes for okay. the end of the talk, although again, you can bite a little bit into the question session. But again, losing question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, okay, and so, um, so that's entanglement. Now we move on to correlations. We repeat the same analysis for the total correlation function we defined. And um, we get qualitatively similar results for the correlations. Here uh, for T naught equals zero, we have degradation of correlations uh, compared to Minkowski space. And here for T naught equals one, we have enhancement of correlations uh, compared to Minkowski. 
And of course, we can also decompose the correlation function into a Minkowski part and a gravitational wave contribution. And we can plot the latter as a function of the gravitational wave frequency um, for different energy gaps of the detector for both time-like and space-like separated detectors. And for T0 equals zero, the contributions are also uh, negative, which is consistent with the middle plot of the previous slide. And for T0 equals one, the contributions are going to be positive. And so the, we expect enhancement of correlations with respect to Minkowski. And um, in both, again, in both of these slides, the, the resonance effect so remains for the correlations. And this can be explained be also analytically because the concurrence and the correlation function uh, both share their dependence on the matrix element X. And the gravitational wave contribution to the matrix element X, analytically speaking, we can, uh, there's a function that um, uh, an oscillatory function uh, whose functional form allows one to read off the resonance condition, the gravitational wave frequency being approximately twice the energy gap of the detectors. And so just to summarize, um, the gravitational waves uh, affect the joint statistics of detectors interacting locally with the field. They modify the vacuum entanglement structure of a field theory. And uh, the way that they modify this entanglement structure crucially depends on the T naught parameter or the peak interaction time of the detector with the field um, compared to where the gravitational wave is in its cycle or phase. Um, and there exists an interesting resonance effect for both the correlations and the um, con uh, concurrence, so entanglement. And just as a short slide for future plans or where to take this, um, one path could be gravitational wave induced decoherence, where instead of considering an initially separable detector state, we can consider a Bell state. So there's already entanglement in the state of the two detectors. And we ask the same question, what happens to the reduced state of the two detectors after having interacted with the field uh, over the gravitational wave background? And this is a different question because this asks, what happen how does the gravitational wave modify entanglement already present in the uh, state of the two detectors? And another path we can take this is the memory effect, which is a purely classical general relativistic prediction that if given an initial space time, um, we can perturb it with a gravitational wave. And this gravitational wave will lead to a non-oscillatory contribution to the metric such that the space time you end up in is inherently different from the one that you had started off with. And so it would be interesting to see how this purely classical result gets encoded in the entanglement uh, structure or vacuum entanglement structure of a field theory living on these space lines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hadi. That's very nice, very nice talk. Thank you. All right, same as before. If there are questions, raise your hands and I'll allow you to unmute yourselves. So I see Rob. First, so let me just allow Rob. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks. I thought it was a nice talk. Um, I, I, I mean, if you said this, I missed it. Why? What is T not doing that enhances the entanglement when you change that parameter? What, what's the insight as to why this is happening? When, when entanglement harvesting is enhanced, if I remember the diagram correctly, it was enhanced as T naught got bigger. Right. So is this some re resonance effect or right. something? Yes, uh, exactly. Um, wait, let me find the... Okay, so I think it's clear here. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so um, in the matrix element X, because the concurrence and the correlation both share that dependence on X, 
the gravitation wave contribution to the matrix on X has this functional form that's like an oscillatory function that gives you a resonance effect, but there's also that T naught um, resonance effect as, as you called it, um, that leads to this uh, qualitatively different result. So it's basically coming from this um, term. In the okay, so, so does that mean if I increased T naught, it will grow to some value the way it is in the right, but if I further increase it, it'll start declining again? I would assume so, but I, I, I think I'd have to go back to the analytic um, expression, but I would assume that that's what happens. There's a periodic um, Okay, so, so in other words, there's some optimum value of T naught exactly. that will, and likewise, the same thing happens for the total correlation. I'm exactly. trying to remember the- Right, as you yeah, can right. So, so presumably that, I mean, I think it might be interesting to know what the optimal value is and how you, you know, you can uh, squeeze the most juice out of the orange, I guess, and gain right. some insight as to why this is happening. Yep. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you Rob. Uh, so Hamed, uh, you can uh, also ask your question now. You can unmute yourself. Hamed Shalabi. Oh. Yeah, there we um, go. Thank you so much, Shady, for the talk. I basically had the same question as Dr. Mann, but, um, and sorry if I missed it. What was the exact form of the uh, switching function? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I didn't say it, but I wrote it down, I think. Uh, where, oh, yeah. So here, um, that's the, that's where the switching function comes from. Right, right. The uh, Gaussian. Um, sorry, I didn't say this. Okay, yeah, no worries, no worries. Sorry, I missed it. Okay, and the idea is, as you were saying, that um, so the T naught is the peak of this Gaussian function in this case, and yeah. you could either amplify or like decrease the amount of entanglement based on like you're basically saying if we can align the T zero with the peak of the background gravitational wave. Right, that's exactly. The, that's the punchline. Okay. Yes. Okay, and sorry, the um, just one last thing. So the resonant condition, omega being around double the energy gap, that is independent of the T0 you're using, right? Yes, um, the, yeah. Again, it all comes back to this term, the gravitational wave contribution to X. And in that like functional form, you have some T naught information that I just talked about and you have that resonance condition like omega plus or minus twice the energy gap. So it's in the, like it's in the same bin, but it's they're independent. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, Alison. Alison, you can unmute yourself and, and ask the question, hopefully. Yes. All right. Um, so the the for a single detector you can't excite uh due to this gravitational wave uh contribution you get a sort of a death of of transition probability yes um, okay at least for this parameter for this like, set of parameters okay so yeah. that's so the the gravitational wave doesn't affect the the transition probability now the the minkowski contribution does it okay. does but okay, it doesn't okay. Yeah, this, this, this may actually, that probably answers my question, but so my, my then you, you still have these correlations. So the, the it's somehow, the, or sorry, you still have entanglement. So it's somehow that the gravitational wave contribution, while it's not exciting the detector, it's sort of picking out which ways in which the Minkowski contribution can excite the detector, right? Because the gravitational wave is an exciting individual detector. So this is, this is sort of very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, I think initially we were also kind of surprised by this um, because, um, yeah, like the energy isn't affected. Like the, the transition probability isn't affected for these trajectories. Um, but that, that's not to say that um, the whole thing is zero, right? Like the gravitational wave just doesn't add or uh, subtract away from how Minkowski changes um, the transition probabilities. And it was surprising to see that 
um, even though this was zero, um, these weren't the gravitational wave uh, contributions to the matrix on X um, and C, those weren't um, zero. And yes, uh, I also, but, but this, this comes back to the, like how you're probing the entanglement. And so uh, at, like uh, eventually it all comes down to how X and C uh, are changing, even though the P's aren't in some sense. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. There's uh, one question by Chris. Mm -hmm. You can you can unmute yourself, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. I was just wondering, could you say something more about how your state was chosen in the gravitational wave background? I wasn't clear about that. Shadi, you're muted. I don't know. Okay. There you go. Yeah, no, no, it, it wouldn't let me unmute. I mean, um, which state are you? So the state in which you're computing things like the excitation of the Unruh DeWitt detector or trying to harvest enti entanglement, this state here. So this is your Whiteman function yeah. in the gravitational wave space-time. Where, where does this, what, what state are you using here? Okay, um, so, so good question. This like comes back to um, like which vacuum? Um, yes. Yeah, we're, we're choosing. And essentially what we're doing is, um, so here, we have this gravitational wave space time, but when you go to like home coordinates, um, you can perform quantization. This is just like, for example, okay, if we just take Minkowski space and compare quantizations of a square scalar field um, versus in Minkowski versus like light cone coordinates, um, the vacuums are equivalent. And so we're just building off of that and um, the Gibbons work in gravitational waves where he also uses um, the vacuum state afforded to us from light cone quantization. Mm -hmm. So I was also wondering whether your results are robust if you were to choose a different state. So when you say that gravitational waves either suppress or, or uh, you know, or enhance uh, harvesting. Yeah, uh, I would assume that, um, okay, so our results are, of course, only uh, applicable to the vacuum so far, but um, because then I'd expect the Whiteman function, you know, the Whiteman function associated, the correlation function associated to the different states to maybe act in a different way, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, there would be different correlation functions, so I'm not exactly sure how that would play in. All right, thank you very much. I have a um, uh, couple of quick questions, hopefully, myself, if there are no more. Yeah. Anyway, I think that Don Page wants to, to ask a question, actually. Well, I don't see it. Uh, I don't see oh, the hand. He literally <laughs> raises hands, not virtually, I mean, oh, for the video. Please go ahead, Don, unmute yourself. And go ahead and ask. I couldn't see it because the hand. If you yeah, use I want to it, how do you do it virtually? I don't even know this Zoom. Ah, there's a button somewhere. <laughs> okay. okay, I'll look for that later. No, I just I just wondered because okay, you have these two detectors, and because the gravitational wave goes by, then of course the proper distance between the detector, you know, uh, the detectors oscillates. Right. I would. It, it might be an interesting comparison to suppose that you compared just in Minkowski space-time, but have the detector separation have the same function of, of the time as, as it does in the gravitational wave. In other words, just, in, just leave it flat space, but have the detectors physically you know, oscillate. So they, they have non-zero acceleration, right? but the distance between them is the same as they would have in the gravitational wave where, they, you know, where neither one has an acceleration, but they're, the distance is oscillating. Right. That, that's a very good question. Um, we, we actually got that question a couple of times. Um, and essentially, we, we did some numerical studies where we did compare that. So we chose essentially different, um, sorry, yeah, different trajectories. We had like uh, D cosine, whatever, like an oscillating uh, spatial dependence. 
And um, you can see that uh, numerically, you can see that the, the effect is different um, when you compare it to the gravitational wave. But you can also more convincingly see this analytically because um, the, the gravitational wave contribution to the Whiteman function has a functional derivative of the delta function, which does not show up for the detectors in uh, detectors oscillating in Minkowski space. So there is a very like there is a very different um, effect coming purely from uh, the gravitational wave. Um, and finally, the reasoning why we chose these two detectors is because um, we're comparing geodesics in right. both of these space lines. So um, yeah, the, your comparison would also be interesting, um, but yeah, they wouldn't be, uh, it would just look at the, what the gravitational wave does fixing the distance changing effect, if that makes sense. Mm, thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, I think Thales has a question too, informally raises uh, <laughs> and then Alison. I mean, we have um, technically the next talk, uh, Wang Kong should start, but I think discussion is uh, really kind of the core of this of this kind of event. So Wang, if you can still make it, uh, if you have a, if you're in a rush, we can move, but Wang, if you can still make it, uh, if we allow for maybe say five more minutes for, of questions. Then... Yeah, definitely. I can still make it. Go oh, ahead. Thank you. I think this is kind of what we do these things for. So yeah. uh, Thales first, then Alison. And then I may ask the question to abusing power a bit. <laughs> All right. So actually, the question is regarding the the fact that the the waves themselves don't affect the transition probability of the detector. Yeah. So you did this calculation perturbatively, right? Right. It's the second order it's standard. Uh, uh, right. Corrections to the probability that you find in the UDW detector. Right. Now, uh, have you tried to do like uh, because it, you have sort of like two expansions, right? You have to expand in the amplitude of the, the gravitational wave and also in the, the coupling constant at the end. Right. And um, the, the question is essentially, uh, do, do you have any sort of non-perturbative result to this? Like in the sense, if you get a delta coupling detector, we, we could uh, actually get a non-perturbative uh, uh, probability amplitude for the, for the detector, like for the uh, change in the, in the probability uh, and mm -hmm. the for the excitation probability. Have you, like, in that case, would that also be zero? Uh, ha have you tried this using your, your results? Um, I, I don't think we've done anything non-perturbative in, in this work. Um, I, I would assume that the, the effects are different as you change these uh, parameters. But the, yeah, we haven't done anything non-perturbative. Um, so I, I can't really speak as to what happens when you there, there, there's something to be said, maybe if, I, if I'm intervening on that, because this is related to the question. Uh, if you were to delocalize your detector, if you consider a smear detector rather than a point like one, I would expect even perturbatively that that would see it because the most motion in a way there would be tidal forces that would try to squeeze that detector and right. that would try to oppose motion. So I think even is the fact that it's point like, I don't know because I haven't done the calculations either, but I would bet that it's the fact that it's point like that makes that there's no contribution there. Now, of course, you cannot do perturbatively with deltas if it's point like. <laughs> you yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I agree with that. Um, but I, I also haven't done the calculations. These so. would be interesting things to, to check and it's like simple calculations, to be honest, right? Indeed, yeah. And ju just just to, to, to finish, uh, you, you assumed that, the, <laughs> you assumed that the, the, the mass of the field is, was zero from the beginning, right? Would yeah. it be completely impossible to, to solve Klein Gordon's equation with a different, with a non zero mass field? I, I don't think it would be too hard, uh, honestly, but we just wanted to see the effect um, as simple as it comes because the we have basis solutions, the mode solutions for a mass for a massive scalar field. Oh, right. Well. So, it's... so you can just repeat the same thing for. Yeah, I, I don't think it would be too hard to to generalize. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, you did, you do deserve the time, so it's totally okay. Uh, then we have two more questions or two more questionnaires, I guess. Uh, we have Alison and Ken. Maybe it's okay if I let Ken do first because Ken has done none and then Alison, Alison after. That's, That's fine. All right, Ken, go ahead. Hi, uh, yeah, one question. Uh, so regarding your T0. Right. 
uh, that was the peak of the Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Was it right? Yeah. Okay. So you're, you chose T zero equals zero and one. Yeah. Now, have you tried other variables like T zero or 0.5, two or? Sure. Um, yeah. The, the, the dependence on T naught comes from the matrix element X, the gravitational wave contribution to that. And the, the, analytic functional form of that is like a periodic function in T naught. Zero. So, uh, so yeah, you could just do choose any. Okay. Well, I assume that the, the reason you get larger concur, did, yeah, did you get larger concurrence for T zero equals one? Yes. Okay, I assume that that's because like you can signal the detectors can signal in that case, like even in your uh, next figure, I guess, like a uh, line plot, like you're, you, you're choosing the separation 0.7 and 1.5 with the Gaussian switching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think support of the Gaussian, uh, so the light cone, so the uh, mass scalar field propagates uh, like, like, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the support of the Gaussian is like on the, um, the light cone of the other detector so that they can, uh, communicate with each other, even though they are in a space that's separated. The, the causal structure from mm -hmm. the Gaussian comes from the the sigma like the proper time so whenever d is like greater than sigma then you have space like and when it's less then you have time like um mm -hmm. so but here you're plotting things dimensionless um so everything's in terms yeah. of sigma so here they're time like like actually time like and here they're actually space like um so yeah I, oh sorry yeah that was a uh, time -like. okay yeah yeah so, so i i thought you know, if you choose T naught equals one, mm -hmm. then maybe the, uh, the, what, like uh, the Gaussian, like a peak of the Gaussian is on the light cone or something. Yeah, no, I see. But uh, re-expressing things in terms of sigma, just no, these are like actually, um, yeah, the causal structure doesn't come from T naught. It comes from like how sigma um, the duration of the interaction, so the support of the Gaussian. So I, I don't think that is, uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe I can just quickly say too. I mean, yeah, these are. You're right that the support of these Gaussians is is overall sort of time, and so these notions that Shadi's talking about, space like and time like, are ultimately approximate. Approximate where basically we're in a regime where we can neglect the interaction with with the field anymore. And then just this T naught, like Shadi was saying, is, is um, it more has to do with when the peak interaction of the detectors occurs relative to the phase of the gravitational wave. So where that background space comes. All right. Uh, Thanks. Thank Go you. Alison, can you hear me? Sorry, I started asking my question without unmuting. Uh, so you see uh, the death of mutual information for certain values of T naught, is that right? Mutual information? Or so total correlations, not just entanglement, but total correlations? Oh, yes, total correlations. Okay, um, and is this just sort of defined by the, is this the, 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 um, the gravitational wave sort of uh, suppressing all of the correlations or are you just looking at the gravitational wave term? So it's like the, the whole state? The, this is the whole thing. This is Okay, and is this thing. something, so this is something that you don't often see in, for example, Minkowski space times. So is this something that is seen generally in curved space times? Uh, I, I don't think I can speak for uh, ge general curved spaces, uh, but yeah, it, it happens here. Um, okay. So. All right, and then I have a, another quick comment, which was about uh, Don's question. He talked about doing accelerated detectors to sort of mimic the, the, the change in the proper time, but right. then you're going to start seeing particle production, right, because of the acceleration of the detectors. Yeah. So then you're going to sort of have a fundamentally different sort of exactly. uh, uh, environment. 
yeah, do yeah, the Enra effect or other. I mean, it's it, if you have short time scales, it's not really the Enra effect, but yeah. Right. Yeah. It just comes down to what you're fixing and what you're trying to compare, I think. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Anyway, all right. that's that's all I had. Thank Thanks you. so much. It was a good talk. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Uh, so I'm abusing my power a little bit. I just asked one very quick question. Of course. I have, I have a thousand questions, so I'm going to just uh, refrain from doing that. The, it was a, a really great talk. Uh, one of my questions was actually, which is exactly right, that the, um, this is, uh, I don't think this is uh, comparable in many ways. Also, to add to what Alison said, also, you would have a non trivial local noise change. You would also, don't have the ability to separate the trajectory effects from the from the uh, inertia trajectory effects in general for a general trajectory. So it's really, really very different. I think when you ask this question, you can just say, no, nothing to do with <laughs> that, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, the, it's still interesting to compare. Still right. interesting to compare. I'm not saying it's not interesting at all, but definitely this is a different effect. Right, of course. The, the one question that I have, and I'll leave it at that, Mm -hmm. is that I think that you've been very optimistic with drawing the line of space line, which is fine. I guess you don't focus on that too much. But uh, uh, when we've done these things with Gaussians, right, uh, we kind of argued our way through the fact that uh, a good line for the space like is something like seven sigma <laughs> rather than one, mm -hmm. because uh, still the, the interaction is certainly not negligible at all between them when they're at one sigma. Right. Uh, there's arguments to make, uh, right, right? But I think... Uh, because you didn't really insist too much, right? I would say that in the middle, for example, you don't have space like entanglement, I would say, for example. Uh, yeah. Anyway, something to consider. Uh, I do think that calling it space like here is not the right thing to do. At, at the, at where you draw the line, I mean. I, 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 I agree kind of with that, but the, the point is like, this is all perturbative. The, the gravitational wave itself, the amplitude, amplitude seen by LIGO or ridiculously small. So the effect is going to be um, realistically very small as well. Uh, but yeah. Well, the relative so I'm talking relative differences here. Huh? So yeah, no, no, yeah, no, yeah I, I see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, I don't want to take more of your time. I really let me let me compliment this question, actually. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm using my part a little bit as well. Okay. Uh, have you tried any so, uh, completely supported function like uh, uh, a switching function that is zero then one then zero or something like this. Uh, no, we that just... would solve Eduardo's problem. You see, the problem is with the tail of the Gaussian. Right. Yeah. Uh, we we just looked at uh, the Gaussian, um, but yeah, that that would be something to consider as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Thales, uh, Rick. Uh, really, Sadi, uh, Sadi, a uh, very nice talk. Appreciate Thank it, you. and I really appreciate the discussion that comes in. If I have to compromise in time, as long as the speakers are okay with it, I really prefer this kind of talk and this kind yeah. of discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Shadi. Thank you again. Thank you all. And thank you all the contributors that ask questions. And Don, uh, if you don't find the, here's a thing for you. If you don't find the, the raise hand button, Don, what you can do is just unmute yourself and you'll be able to do it and just tell me, I have a question. Because I only see on the, at the top of the screen, uh, whoever raises hands, if that works. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll try to learn. I'll try to look for this button. <laughs> it's, okay. That's great. Sounds Sorry great. That. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks very right. much. Thank you. Wang, thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> you're, you're next. All right. The next speaker of this session, the last speaker of this session is Wang Kong. Uh, Wang is a, is a PhD student uh, at Waterloo, Rockman's student. And she's going to talk about uh, endowment harvesting in mirror space science. Thank you, Wang. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, um, Eduardo, for the introduction. So, and also for organizing this nice conference virtually. And so today the presentation, um, I've, and I've titled it Entanglement Harvesting in Mirror Space Times with this subtitle, With and Without Horizons. So um, if you're interested, you can look at the um, archive paper. It's also been published in JHAP. But for your convenience, this is the archive number. And this was work done in collaboration with um, Chen Chen, Michael Good, and Rockman. So let me get started to talk about this mirror space times. Um, if you are not familiar with this mirror space time, is probably the first question that you're wondering is why are we interested in looking at this type of space times? So let me start with a small motivation. 
Uh, the story sort of began in 1977 by a series of paper um, put up by Davis and Fulling, where they show that actually the calculation which Hawking did for um, Hawking radiation has a simple analog in this mirror space times. And uh, I found this nice illustration in the 1977 paper where they show that actually, if you just do a conformant transformation, then the Penrose diagram for the space-time, Minkowski space-time with the mirror can be transformed into one which looks very much like um, a black hole. And this is part of the reason why this mirror space-times is a good toy model for um, studying Hawking radiation. So as I was saying, the interest in this model arises due to this analogous particle creation in this mirror space times to the collapse scenario. And in addition, because they are just um, in one plus one dimensional Minkowski space times, these are really a much more simpler model to work with. And that's why they gain this pro um, popularity. So even though it started off as a toy model, um, now it's actually gaining even physical significance because in effect, what these models describe is the creation of particles by moving boundary. And today is just called the dynamical Casimir effect. And back even in 2011, there has been some papers put out claiming that they've actually observed this effect. So these are just some um, motivations for looking at mirror space times. Of course, our main motivation is um, more aligned with the first point. Okay, so now everybody is interested in this mirror space times. Let's get down to how the physics works. Um, as, in, as is usual in studying particle creation, we're um, in the semi classical picture. So we start off with, um, for this presentation, just a simple massless scalar field. Um, and this is all in one plus one dimensional Minkowski space. But what the mirror does is to impose a directly boundary condition. So the mirror is moving with some arbitrary trajectory in space time. And I've denoted the spatial coordinate of the mirror by this X sub M. And the boundary condition is just that the field is restricted to go to zero at the mirror. So the illustration of this mirror space times is um, by this diagram on the left. So if we have now rays coming in from the right, what the mirror does is just cause the null rays to be reflected back towards the right. And I'm also going to use the um, usual notations for mirror space times. So in the usual null coordinates, V and U, the trajectory of the mirror is described by this function, um, V equals to P of U. So depending on the trajectory, of course, this um, function p will take different forms. But once we get this function, then it is a simple matter to write down a, a set of complete autonomous solutions to the scalar field equation. And that is given by this u sub case. So each of these modes is simply made up of a part that is moving towards the left and a part that's moving towards the right. So um, we can move on to do the canonical quantization and define a vacuum with respect to this set of states. And the vacuum is simply just the state that is annihilated by all the annihilation operators associated to these field modes. So in the literature, if you define the vacuum this um, way, this vacuum is usually called the in vacuum. So as promised, this is a very sweet and simple model, which we have understood in just one slide. So coming up next, I'm going to talk about how we can probe this vacuum using the Henri Dewitt detector. So um, we have heard of it in the previous talk, so I'll be short on this. Basically, why we want this um, detector is we want to give an operational meaning of what it means to detect a particle in curved space times. And this model was first proposed in back in 1976 by Onru. And how we use this uh, model is to say that 
well, the detector is just a particle with internal energy levels. And if um, the particle makes a transition between energy levels, then we say that a detection of a quanta from the field has been made. Um, and the energy of this detector quanta is just the transition gap that the particle made. So then this model was simplified by David in 1979 to the modern form that we have today. So the interaction proceeds via this um, interaction Hamiltonian, where this is all the terms that we've seen in the previous talk. So lambda is the coupling constant, which we can do perturbation theory in. Chi is a switching function, um, which describes how the interaction's strength varies in space, oh, sorry, varies in time. And then mu hat here is the monopole operator of the detector and phi hat is the field operator, but that's um, evaluated along the trajectory of the detector. So um, for this talk, like in the previous talk, we are just going to concentrate on a detector that has two energy levels, which is denoted here by cat zero and cat one. And again, I'm also using capital omega to denote the energy gap between these two levels. So um, suppose we start off the initial state of the detector and the field in the ground state and the vacuum state, the in vacuum state, then by using first order perturbation theory, we can compute the transition probability P of omega. So this P of omega is a double integral which depends on the switching function, the energy gap of the detector, as well as the Weinmann function, which is the two points correlator of the field. So, um, yeah, this is just a simple model, but actually it has been shown that it's a good, so even though it is simple, it actually models well the light matter interaction. Okay, so we have seen um, one detector, but it's simple to just now consider two detectors. If you have two detectors, then the Hamiltonian is just a sum of the individual Hamiltonian of the detectors and I'm going to use capital A and B to denote the two detectors. So um, once again, we are going to start off the system in the ground state. And what's interesting is that even though the detectors start off in a separable state, after interacting with the field, the detectors can become entangled. So this is the formula state that um, we have already seen, and basically it um, has these entries, the P, A, and P, B are the excitation probabilities of detectors A and B. And this X term is also some um, double integral involving the Weichmann function of the field. Um, so in general, this resulting state, the partial state of detectors A and B can be entangled and the amount of entanglement can be measured using um, this concurrence function, which takes this expression for this simple state. So um, as you already know, if concurrence is more than zero, the state is entangled. And if it's, if it's a separable state, the concurrence will be zero and it increases with the amount of entanglement. So the fact or the phenomenon that these two detectors can end up being entangled even though they start off from a separable state is now called, called entanglement harvesting. So since they had like no entanglement to start off with, then this entanglement is actually being swapped or entangled from the field vacuum and therefore the name entanglement harvesting, right? And um, it has been studied well studied in the literature in various space times, such as anti-dissiter black hole space times, and as we've just seen, um, space times where a gravitational wave passes through. So really, this um, formalism is 
a good way to probe the vacuum width or to give an operational meaning to what it means to actually make some measurements from the vacuum. And therefore it is um, a really good model that we can use and which I'm going to use to probe um, the mirror space times. So with the formalism introduced, you can already now look at some results in the of entanglement harvesting in mirror space times. And I'm I am going to start off with the simplest mirror, which is just a static mirror that is located at x equals to zero. So on the bottom figure is um, a plot of the concurrence, which was our entanglement measure against d sub a. So at this d sub a, that is um, a distance measure between detector A and the mirror. So if you look at this top um, schematic figure, because, okay, in here the mirror is static, but later on, I'm going to let the mirror move. So actually the distance between detector A and the mirror is not fixed, but um, recall that we are also going to give the detectors a switching function and the switch function that we are using is, it looks like a Gaussian. So it peaks at some intermediate time. And I'm going to denote the time which it peaks as capital T. So then as a distance measurement between the detector A and the mirror, I'm just going to let D sub A to denote the distance between detector A and the mirror at this big time T. Right. And so this dA is what's plotted here at the horizontal axis. So now even in this um, simple static mirror case, we can already um, get some interesting results out from this graph. And that is, if we look at all these curves, which are basically um, the concurrence for different energy gaps, we see that the general behavior is that at large distances, all the curves will asymptote to some finite value. And this value is actually just given by the Minkowski value, or the, in other words, the value in which the mirror is not there at all. But before they reach this asymptotic value, the, at some intermediate smaller distances, the concurrence actually peaks above this asymptotic value. So in other words, the presence of the directly boundary or the mirror actually can um, enhance entanglement. So this figure was um, actually obtained from a previous work done in 2019, but this is what we found in um, space times with a directly boundary condition. So another thing that I would like to mention here is how the Whiteman function looks like. So the um, main message is the Whiteman function depends on the function P of U. So remember that P of U just describes the trajectory of the mirror. So for example, in the static mirror case, you have P of U equals to U. And I'm just mentioning it here because I'll um, need these facts later on. Okay, so that was the static mirror. The static mirror was just um, a starter. So now we come to the main cause of this presentation, which is actually to look at this family of trajectories of um, the mirror, which is um, the explicit, explicit form is given by this equation. So it is a family that is parameterized by this parameter C. And basically what this C does, C is, is just um, the final asymptotic speed of these mirrors. So for each C value, the mirrors, they're accelerating towards negative X and eventually they'll reach some asymptotic speed and that is given by C. So what we're interested in, in this family of trajectory is to ask the question, whether concurrence um, depends on if C is less than or equals to one. And 
why we focus on the C equals to one mirror is because only when C equals to one does the mirror space time actually develops a kind of horizon. By horizon here, we mean that um, on this Penrose diagram, the horizon is just given by this red dotted line. And it is a horizon in the sense that if you consider light rays um, originating from square minus right before the horizon, then this light rays will travel, hit the mirror, and then be reflected to square plus right. But um, beyond these horizons, the light rays actually just um, travel straight through to square L plus instead of reaching square right plus. And that is why. One, uh, one very, very quickly is five minutes left. Again, as okay. usual, uh, you may buy a bit into the questions. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I was, as I was saying, yeah. Um, so that's the reason why we were interested in looking at the C equals to one mirror. So it's due to this sudden change in the causal structure when C becomes one. So even though if you look at the trajectories, it seems that mm, things seems to be smooth when C equals to one, but actually there is this sudden change, um, the sudden appearance of the horizon when C becomes one. So the question is, does this um, sudden change in the structure has any signature on the concurrence or the entanglement harvested between the detectors? Okay, so let's look again at the plot of concurrence against D sub A for these various mirrors. Um, the first comment I would like to make on this graph is that what's new as compared to the static mirror case is this small region close to the mirror where there is actually no entanglement harvested. So this effect, it was actually already observed in, a, in that previous paper in 2019. And we found, where we found that this lack of entanglement near the mirror is actually a general feature of accelerating mirrors as in, in this case. But coming back to the story of whether the horizon is present or not, it turns out that if you just look at this graph, there's actually, it does not seem to have any qualitative difference between the C equals to one mirror, which in case you're wondering, is given by this dashed um, purple curve, which actually overlaps with the C slightly less than one mirror given in red here. So we have seen no qualitative like big changes in the concurrence. Then let's ask the question, well, let's consider a different situation in which we switch on the detectors at later times. So um, as I mentioned previously, the parameter C actually just um, describes the final asymptotic speed of the mirror. So at late times, the mirrors, all these mirrors just move with approximately constant speed C. And in fact, it can be shown that at large times, the function P of U actually has um, a limiting form that looks like this. And this thing on the right is just the P U function of a mirror that is moving eternally at a constant speed C. However, if you substitute in C equals to one into this right-hand side, then this thing actually just becomes zero. So what this means for the um, transition probability and for the X term, if we put everything back into the Whiteman function and look at the um, result is that there exists a finite large time, large T limit for the probability when C is less than one, but the limit does not exist when C is equals to one. So um, if you look at the concurrence against capital T plot, this is um, the result that we get. So we see that for all the C less than one 
uh, graphs, they're all asymptotes to this value, which is the same value that it gets if you consider it an eternally um, constant speed mirror. But for when c is equals to one, it seems that at large times, the concurrence just continue to increase linearly. And um, of course, in practice, we will not see this because we expect perturbation theory to eventually break down. However, we just interpret this result as saying that it seems that the, there is um, a real signature of whether the horizon is present or not on the concurrence of the detectors. Okay. So this is actually the main and last result that I'm going to show for my presentation. However, I'd like to end with a small aside. And that is to compare that graph with the entanglement entropy um, of the space-time. So remember that concurrence was a measurement of entanglement between the detectors. Well, in this case, the entanglement entropy, um, S of U, is kind of like a, a measurement of a, the purity of the radiation that has been radiated up to um, the time u. So if we um, plot that s against u, we actually see a, the similar behavior. So both s and the concurrence for the c equals to y mirror actually tends to um, grow in time without bound. However, um, as in the entanglement entropy and concurrence case, it is actually hard to give um, an explanation or interpretation of why this blow up happens. But um, we would like to point out just this coincidence that somehow these two entanglement measures seems to both show the same type of behavior whenever the horizon is pre um, present. So, Maybe this is a general feature when information loss is present in the space time. Of course, whether this is true in general or whether this is just true in one plus one space time dimensions, um, we leave it for investigations for future work. Okay, so um, I've come to the end of my talk and this is just a summary slide. I'll leave it for you guys to read it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for your talk, Juan. Thank you. All right. Do we have questions from the audience? Please raise your hand, or I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself just in case. Uh, try to use the hand. If you don't have the hand uh, or you can't find it, just uh, unmute yourself and tell me. Okay. Benito. All right. Uh, you can talk. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. Ah, you can hear me. Very yeah. good. Um, I, I, it's, just a, it's just a very general question. I mean, I, I really like the talk, but I didn't, I didn't quite get what the definition of horizon was. I mean, I couldn't really interpret horizon in which sense, because when you presented the idea of well, when it, when it asymptotes to, um, in, in the case C equals one, um, it just said, well, these rays are never gonna go to the, to scry plus on the right. But I thought this is, I mean, this can happen in Minkowski as well, right? I mean, you, you have light rays moving to the left, are they just gonna get to scry plus on the left, not to scry plus on the right? Or am I to interpret this as some kind of, dynamical horizon or kind of like in the Rindler situation. I, it, this point wasn't very clear to me. This is, this is all I wanted to ask. Okay, um, thank you. I, 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 don't, I think I'm not muted, right? So can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I, I can. Okay, so yeah, um, it is, uh, as you said, it is not, mm, really like a horizon in the black hole sense, but um, usually what I interpreted why the literature called this a horizon is um, in the mirror space times, we're kind of interested in only the scribe right and um, 
plus and square right minus. So because if the mirrors were um, always time-like, so if they did not have this ending on square left case, um, okay, maybe something else that I've said, I should have said is, we're only interested in the space times to the right of the mirror. And that is why we are basically interested in looking at square right plus and square right minus. So whether um, everything sent out from square right minus can be received from, by square right plus. And it turns out that if we have this horizon, that cannot happen. But if you do not have this, so if the mirrors all goes to us on future time like infinity, that everything can be received by the right horizon. Sorry, right square plus. Okay, okay, thank you. And I mean, in, in this picture that you're showing, it looks like there's a little kind of like a kink or something in the on the red line, which is, I guess, the c equals one, right? It's a little like a little cusp or something. But that's yeah. just that's just really because it really becomes null or something like that, right? And it's just a it's just an artifact of the of the Penrose diagram. Um, um, yes, yeah, so I, I think this is. Um, just a schematic diagram. Yeah. In, uh, yeah. <laughs> so this okay, is not how it really looks like in a parallel diagram. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, anyway, uh, nice to nice to meet you as well, Benito. I don't think we've uh, coincided in person, and this is the sad part of these kind of conferences. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's there's no there's no bar after the meeting. Right. Sadly. Also, yeah. Also, your name, I, I like your name a lot. It's a very remarkable <laughs> name for those people <laughs> in <feel> Mexico. <laughs> Benito Juarez was the first uh, indigenous origin president of Mexico. So that's a really remarkable name to have. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Anybody else has any more questions? I have a question, uh, yes. OK, oh, sorry. Uh, you does anyone have like and high priority? There are two people that talk. One was uh, Rick, the other one was? Uh, that was me, uh, Sure. Okay, cool. Let's go like that. Rick first, and then sure. Uh, so, one, uh, thanks for your your presentation. In the beginning, you started motivating these mirror space times by talking about uh, black holes and the, the similarities, right, between the, the Penrose diagrams of them. And, well, there are lots of studies as well of entanglement harvesting in, in black hole space times and, and things related to that. So how do your results compare to the entanglement harvesting results from, from black hole space terms? Can you, can you compare and, and talk a little bit about this? Um, I'm not sure if much of the results actually carry over because um, in like what the question that we focus here is whether the horizon is present or not. Okay, I guess even in Maybe we can could have compared it with scenarios in which the um, matter collapsed but did not form a black hole, so that the horizon was not there. So, um, but unfortunately, yeah, we did not make such a comparison because um, I'm. I think there are actually models where even in one plus one dimension we have some collapsing things that does not form a horizon. So yeah, it will be something, um, an interesting question to look at, like whether the results carry forward too. But the only comments I can make, a little, a small comment on regarding black holes is just the presence of this lack of um, entanglement region. So um, I think in, the paper which Laura did on BTZ, this lack of entanglement zone near the black hole horizon was also seen. So even though the, actually the effects between these two are quite mm, dif difficult to draw the parallelism because here it's really just due to the Dirichlet boundary, while in their case is um, related to the shift of the rate shift of the mode functions close to the horizon. No, but that's very good. That, that sort of answers my question. Thank you so much for drawing this similarity. OK, thanks. Thank you, Rick. So, Shu, you can ask your question. Uh, so so um, I think it's, uh, uh, it was a good talk. Um, 
I think it's a famous result known that the the radiation caused by the mirror is due to the change in acceleration. And um, I was wondering, like, um, if you looked into, like, directly, like, you know, how the change in acceleration, is it the change in acceleration that affects it and no other parameter that affects, you know, the concurrence and all these things? Or is it mainly due to the change in acceleration, which, you know, would be linked to the radiation um, created by the... Um, Mirror. Um, yeah. um, so, it, um, based on the calculations that we did, I, I tend to think that instead of the acceleration of the mirror, it has got more to do with just the speed of the mirror. Uh, like the um, picture or the, the small little thing that I've shown here. So um, the effect is really, we can actually really get the effects just by looking at P of U instead of the acceleration. Uh, yes, but P of U yeah. also affects the frequency. Um, so I uh, like, um, uh, um, it, it would effectively change the, f like there's a boost transformation between the mirror and the detector, I, I think. I, I don't, if, if I under understand correctly. Um, so would it be related to the frequency of like, you know, of your, what your detector is proving relative to the mirror? Um, do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah, the short answer is no, it's because we okay. didn't. Mm. So, I, if your question is, uh, okay, um, maybe I'll make. I'm not sure if this is related to the question, so yeah. I think this effect is. I mean, definitely, it depends on the um, energy gap of the detector, but so long as. Because we know that if the energy gap is um, too small, then it, it will be harder to uh, achieve entanglement. But let's say we stay in a region where entanglement can be harvested. I think this effect um, is probably not going to depend that much on the actual value of the energy gap. Uh, so, um... Are you talking about the purple line going up? Or are you talking about the specific values of um, at t equals six? So, so you said that the frequency won't affect the values. Um, do you mean the frequency doesn't affect um, like, you know, uh, the values it asymptotes to, or are you referring to uh, the purple line, like the, the frequency won't affect the fact that the purple line is linear? Yeah, it's the letter. So I was referring okay. to, yeah, the general. Yeah so, so, yeah, so I would link the linear increase into the fact that at t equals infinite, the, axel, um, and, uh, the, the change in acceleration at the horizon of the mirror is infinity and it's you know the the um, I, I I presume that's 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 the result. Uh, that's the cause of it. Um, so I I can understand the purple line going up. I was just interested to know if like um, you know for example you said the velocity affects it, and I was just you know for example is it, is that to do with velocity causing um, a frequency shift or um, just like, like that. There's lots of effect playing a role, and it would be nice to know like which exact effect um, can be related to okay. the um, values, etc. Yeah, it is true because the the P of U essentially um, is a measure of how the wave modes undergo a redshift, right? 
So yeah, yeah. that's okay. true. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any more questions? All right. If there aren't any more questions, let's uh, thank one again. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. All right. So that brings the first session of uh, this uh, RQI online conference uh, to an end. Uh, remember several things. Number one is um, that we have another session for those of you that can be there that starts at 7, 7 uh, p.m. Waterloo time. So again, EST, adjust to your own your own time zone for that. Same link, it would be the same link, although hosted by, um, by in this case, Tim Rolf. And second, that we will have another session like this one next Wednesday at the same time. This is gonna be, let me remind you, although you probably know, this is gonna be running all the way well until the until April. So probably we have uh, everybody, uh, everybody in the community will get a chance to talk, which is uh, everybody who submitted a talk will get a chance to talk for sure. And uh, I hope that I'll see you again, all of you, uh, next Wednesday. Uh, the talk, the first talk will be Mercedes Martin Benito. And uh, with a bit of luck, it will go, it will run as smooth as, as this session. Thank you very much, everybody. Very, thank you very much to all the speakers. Let's thank again all the speakers. Really great job, great talks. And I'll see you um, either this evening, for me, a generalized evening. Uh, or I'll see you on Wednesday uh, next week. All right. I think that's it. Uh,